Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first SA Stock Pick session of the year. Uh, we had had five sessions last year, which were really su successful, lots of fun, uh, high energy, and we really enjoyed the built up through the uh, back end of last year. We had promised we had start in February. Uh, we would have started last month, but uh, we were dealing with some pretty, pretty uh, uh, exciting markets and and uh, volatile markets towards the back end of February. So had decided to move the session out to uh, to the end of this month. So we are pleased to have you join us today for our first SA stock pick session. It's been six months since we kicked off in our last session, and in the six months, as I'm sure our speakers will uh, attest to, has been really turbulent, um, unprecedented markets with lots of curveballs thrown in from different angles, which many industry professionals have not known how to deal with. In fact, many industry participants, um, uh, the world leaders are all dealing in terrain at the moment that is um, really new territory and, and very cautious and precarious as we move through in terms of the human emotion of what's going down in the Ukraine, as well as the political overhang from any Russia-Ukraine crisis read-throughs to all of our livelihoods and ecosystems. So it really has been markets that have tested us all. Today, we are pleased to be joined by uh, guests who have been on our show before. Uh, so we are joined by Patrice Rousseau from Ashburton Investments, Bright Kumalo from Vestact Asset, Asset Management, Keith McLaughlin from Integral Asset Management, Carmen Mapalwane from APSA Asset Management, and David Shapiro from SASFIN. Uh, Patrice, Bright, Keith, and David were on our first show and Carmen on our third show. So today you're in for a treat as we go through uh, uh, the performance of their stock picks and love to hear from the industry experts how this has panned out, what have been the uh, markets that their stocks tolerated or enjoyed, um, and how they came out of it uh, six months and, and in Carmen's case, five months later from the September session to now. And also I, I, I put them on the spot to say, please throw in any other new exciting uh, markets um, what all the turmoil and volatility has shown is that South Africa is actually quite a diverse marketplace. And as you'll see through the performance of some of your uh, industry experts' uh, stock picks, that is quite clearly evident in, in the moves that we see, either positive or, or, or negative. So without much further ado, I'm going to hand to our guests. We're going to start with Bright and then go to David and followed on by our other guests as we go through each of their stock picks. If you have any questions, please feel free to uh, post them on the uh, link. We'll do our best to post them through uh, to the experts. If they want to uh, answer, they can, but no obligation because we really want this to be free flowing. Uh, I'm sure our guests don't need any introduction, but I'll just ask them to recap for half a second. I don't know if that's even possible more than your first name, but maybe 10 seconds of, of where you're from or, or something interesting, and then let's get straight into it. So, Bright, over to you. Thank you for being on our show. We have you on mute, Bright. Sorry. Okay, I, we're not all trying to unmute ourselves at the same time. <laughs> So yeah, as I was saying, Valdin, thanks for having me on your show again. Um, I guess this is the part where, uh, you know, we look back um, and you keep us uh, honest about our stock picks because it's very easy to just throw picks uh, in the air and people forget about them, but no one, you know, keeps you to, to your word to see actually how the performance has been doing. Uh, and usually, obviously, the excuse would be something along the lines that, um, uh, we, we buy these for the long term, et cetera, et cetera. But let's see how we've done in the past six months. Uh, it's still important uh, if you're an investor. And if you look at my picks uh, that I've picked, it was, uh, you know, the, the, the group uh, that owns uh, and operates a bunch of schools and universities, um, Edvitech, uh, Afrocentric, which is a, a medical aid administrator and sells um, you know, is a retailer of other medical products um, and transaction capital, which is a, a taxi financing operation, which, you know, also came to fame most recently after the acquisition of We Buy Cars, uh, which has, you know, contributed quite a lot uh, to their bottom line and their top line. So those are my three picks. Um, as you can see there, according to the slide, Evitec um, is up about 15%, Afrocentric 14%, and transaction capital just under 30%. Uh, 
in that period and what was going through my mind at the time when I made these picks, I was looking for, um, because David Shapiro came to me and said, look, we want to keep the small cap market uh, buoyant and vibrant uh, to, to, you know, to gain that interest from retail investors. Uh, so I had that in mind and I said, look, I'm in uh, into into this JSE thing and I'm keen to do this and I want good quality businesses that have actually outperformed in the past and they've shown uh, you know that they have some sort of competitive advantage uh, to them and uh, uh, you know when I did my screens uh, these were some of the names that came up and then the other thing I asked myself um, you know looking at the sort of abandoned bin uh, what was in there you know the 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 you know your your lost and found type of bin. And these are the companies that, you know, seem to be, you know, battered down and forgotten. And um, you fast forward six months later, these are the type of returns uh, you're getting from these businesses. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say in terms of returns and, and it is what it is. Uh, but in terms of actually looking for newer opportunities in the small caps uh, space, it has actually been very hard. Uh, because there's been a lot of uh, new, uh, you know, uh, delistings in that sector. Um, so I think I'll stick to these because these were the ones that uh, I liked and I still like very much. And I still there's still a uh, lots of catalysts actually uh, going forward for these businesses. Like I said, COVID had battered down uh, the schooling of Evitech. Uh, students had to ad adapt going online. Uh, we saw that business actually retaining quite a lot of uh, students. Um, which is why, uh, you know, uh, the latest set of numbers uh, look quite positive and you're seeing that big uh, upsurge in the share price. Uh, in the Afrocentric side of things, uh, the catalyst that I like there was the partnership with Sanlam, uh, you know, with selling new uh, insurance, health insurance products. Uh, this business seems to be very resilient, notwithstanding that, uh, you know, there's a big case pending um, in the background. And I think if that case is cleared, uh, Afrocentric share price will start running even harder than uh, what we've seen currently. Uh, transaction capital has always been um, a, an anchor position in my personal portfolio. I've held it since 2010. We had a, a, a nice special dividend not so long ago. And the, as you can see, the share price has since uh, done exceptionally well, just because when it comes to execution, the management uh, is top tier here in South Africa. I always ask myself, why don't we just take the transaction capital management, make them, uh, you know, run things like masters and process? I think we'll have less pain than what we see currently in the market. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll end there. You end on a controversial note, Bright, by saying you want to take the, the transaction capital management team and put them to run NASPERS. Wow, uh, very controversial. Uh, decent performance. Wait, on before, sorry, uh, before you we finish, I'd like everyone who's watching live on YouTube to actually drop uh, our eggplant emoji and the water emoji, you know, as sort of culture. Thank you very much. The eggplant emoji and water emoji. Okay, you're gonna have to school me on this uh, at some point, uh, but that's awesome. Thanks, Bright. Uh, just before we move on, very quickly, very interesting. Well done on the performance of the stocks. Pretty decent returns. And uh, that's for pretty much a, a six month or just over six month period. So if you annualize that, it's looking really, uh, really sexy. And interesting to say that the, these are stock picks that you will keep. So obviously, uh, from the reasons that you bought it, you haven't seen any fundamental shifts and are still quite uh, bullish in the three underlying counters. Yes. OK, good. Great. Any questions for Bryce? If you do, please put them into the chat and, and we'll catch up with the with the YouTube. And then don't forget to drop your eggplant and your water emojis. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Thanks, Bryce. David, um, thank you for joining us and for sharing your wisdom. Uh, let's go over to you and go through your stock picks, please. We there? Yeah, we got you now. What a blips. I can't believe that, that I did that. Anyway, let's go. Back in August, the reason I chose my three stocks was that I was reassured by what I was seeing in the commodity markets, a firmness there. And you know, with the rollouts that we were seeing in vaccines, the global economy was beginning to build in 
the end of the pandemic. You know, we, we hadn't yet come across Omicron, but to be honest, that didn't cause too much disruption um, as well. So my belief was that we would see a big demand uh, in business spending. We would see a big pickup in business spending. And I see this trend continuing now. I think this is a move that's really been agitated by the war in the Ukraine. I think in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a massive boom in fixed investment, a huge growth in the creation of capital stock. And this is going to be led by countries wanting to be self-sufficient in energy and uh, important components such as computer chips. Uh, these are countries that want to see an improvement in for the future in generation in the environment. Uh, that's going to spur this uh, massive demand for renewables, for electric cars, other clean air initiatives. Um, we're also going to have to fix the public health system. And no country, province, city, town, village wants a repeat of the past few years. And also, we have to see an improvement in infrastructure. No more supply chain bottlenecks or broken bridges. So this is going to come on top of uh, technological advancements that we're already in, you know, that we're already seeing that are in place now. That's the uh, 5G, move to the cloud, artificial intelligence, and uh, factory automation. So I chose three companies. I chose AECI, Udeco, Barla World. And they all what I call pick and shovel businesses, whose actual origins actually go back to the finding of the Vitvardisrand. You know, this is my 50th year on the JSC. And when I joined in 1972, they were all listed and they were all prominent companies. Um, and I think they businesses that are well placed to see uh, this increase in uh, spending that we're going to see in mining. You know, AECI is best known for blasting service, for its blasting services. In fact, uh, when you dealt on the floor, on the trading floor, we used to call it bang bangs. If you wanted bang bangs, that was uh, you wanted to deal in ANCI. But it also produces chemicals that are used extensively in mining operations. You know, 70% of the sales come from these divisions. The balance comes from producing chemicals used in agriculture, another big subject, and uh, also in the food and beverage sector. So through December, companies reported very solid numbers. And over the past, past five years, if you look at earnings and dividends, growing around about 9%. So companies still at a very attractive PE, under 10, and a dividend yield of 4 and 3 quarter percent. So even though the performance has been muted, it's still a solid base to, to this business. Hudeco, my other choice, was originally Hubert Davies. This distributes industrial electronic components, batteries, all those things that if you drop them on your toe, they hurt, you know, fasteners, diesel engines, bearings, pipes, and so on. But once more, another solid business. I think it's very underrated on the market, sound balance sheet. We can't fault its financial, still on a very attractive PE, less than nine, and a dividend yield of round about 4%. Here comes my problem, Barlow World. If there's one company on the JSC with exposure to Russia, uh, it's Barlow World. So 70% of Barlow World's uh, revenue comes from the sale and servicing of construction and mining equipment, what we call yellow metal, that's Caterpillar. And a big chunk of that is coming from both Siberia and Mongolia. You know, two areas, um, well, obviously Siberia's in Russia, Mongolia borders on Russia, but a lot of the operations are taking place through that. So at this stage, it's very difficult to guess how the war is going to impact its business. It's brought down Barlow World's price dramatically. It was uh, running well until till this all broke. Uh, and also at the time that I chose it, you know, we came out of a very difficult lockdown. Things were looking up, uh, including the purchase of Tongard starch business. Remember, there was a bit of controversy about Barlow World's purchase of this business. Uh, and also we've seen a recovery and will see a recovery in its car business. But at this point, very difficult to understand what lies ahead for Barlow World because of his exposure there. So what I would do now is I think for choice, I'm going to switch my Barlow World into Omnia. Omnia is a mini AECI. It's, uh, it also makes explosives and also well-placed in what I see is going to be another big boom area, and that's um, a shortage of, uh, of, of of fertilizer. So, yeah, you know, operations were okay. I mean, the companies have done reasonably well. 
Um, but but I still think it's um, you know I still think I'm, I'm going to stick with these businesses for the meantime. Still think some very bright um, you know opportunities ahead. Thanks, David. Um, so just two things. I don't know if you want to just keep that slide up, please, Francois. So it's quite evident to see um, uh, through David's stock picks um, how uh, you know most of the stocks through the performance of when we hit basically back end mm. of. Um, uh, February, where we hit, you know, the the huge market volatility on the back of the um, Russia-Ukraine crisis. You can see all the stocks performing pretty decently up until that point, and then the magnitude. All of them had a little bit of a dip on that February uh, point, but the magnitude was exacerbated, as you mentioned, in Bala World, where it had business operations exposed to Russia. And uh, so it's, you know, it's quite uh, interesting to see how some stocks have recovered and some stocks not. If you look at ACI, better than some of the others. I don't know, David, if you could just spend 30 seconds just elaborating a little bit more on the fertilizer aspect that you spoke of yep. to Omnia. Maybe not everyone's as aware of the dependencies uh, on Ukraine to that the agri's market, but maybe Absolutely. it's worthwhile just sharing that if you don't mind. A shortage of nitrogen and a shortage of, uh, of fertilizer. A lot of it comes out of Russia. Russia is a big exporter. I think almost 10%, I think, I think uh, the US gets about 10% of its fertilizer from um, you know from Russia, so um, they're going to have to replace that. If you've looked at Anglo's and if you look at some of the other mining companies, they're going into that area, and without fertilizer, of course, your crop production comes down. So I think um, it's an area we've discounted. We haven't paid enough attention to, but I think you know we're all looking at at batteries. We're all looking at lithium and all those green metals. But I think just have a look at uh, at fertilizer. Um, I know how to produce it. I think I produce a lot by talking so much, but I mean it's um, it's 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 an area of the market that I think is going to, you know, one's going to have to focus on and uh, concentrate on. Yeah, I think I'm also a big contributor there with my <laughs> talking, David. I, I feel you. Uh, very interesting space, and congratulations on your 50 years in the market. That's pretty pretty impressive. Uh, may we all get to that kind of interest and uh, longevity in this industry. So well done to you. Thank you, David. Uh, next up, Keith, uh, walk us through how your stocks have performed, and if there's any you want to swap in and out. Super, thanks very much, Val. Uh, so, first of all, I'm Keith McCoughlin from Integral Asset Management. And what I'm going to say is going to sound very much like David. Uh, I agree. So, when I set out to pick a Big Corp and Northern, the thematics were quite similar to David's perspective, where I saw the world uh, reopening steadily post COVID. Um, and saw a steady demand for commodities and you want to be well positioned, particularly tactically within that space. Um, the one of my stock picks that disappointed was was Bidcorp. Uh, if, you, if you have a look, it, it hasn't performed particularly well, although what we have seen is the world has reopened. They put out good first half uh, numbers, revenue was up, HIPS was up. They've consolidated market, market position, gained from smaller competitors. Um, and in fact, generated superb cash while cutting our costs from the center. So I think that they better positioned for the world going forward. But the world going forward has uh, arguably stagflationary risks at this point. So reopening plays are, are complicated by the tragedy playing out in Russia and Ukraine uh, and how that affects soft commodity prices, uh, economies around the world and the like, and we and COVID is not there's not a post COVID world. COVID still exists. So how how uh, countries deal with that? So less positive on Bitcoin than I was a year ago or six months ago at least. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about what I would substitute that for. But Northern Northern's continue playing out the way one expected it to. It's well positioned with its PGM basket. It's been growing production. Although the last interim period we saw flat production. Um, that's that's more an anomaly. That's more just uh, more more relevant, more noise than anything else. What we have is we have a steady growing profile. During a period, they've made uh, some uh, some interesting corporate activity where they acquired about a third of uh, Royal Buffer King RB Platts. And in fact, the current set of results does not include about 500 million in RB Platts dividend that will be flowing to Northern as well. So still extremely comfortable with Northern. 
Uh, it doesn't look like it's done a huge amount on the on the screen, but it just depends which time period you've looked at it. Commodity shares will always be volatile. Then Renogen was a slightly different pick, so it, it fitted my my commodity uh, thematic, but it's more specific about the asset and how Steph and his team are are developing it. Over this period, there's been a huge resource uh, upgrade. Uh, there is far more gas and far more helium than uh, than than there was pre that. Phase one will be going live soon. Um, in fact, next month, by the sounds of it, uh, more or less on time on, and on budget over such a chaotic period. And phase two is two years into the planning and is increasingly, by the all sounds of it, much, much larger than we realized. Two very important details that have happened during this period is Arvenhoe Mines has invested directly into the company with a few to, to potentially ramp their stake up. So very tactical blue chip investor directly into this business brings a, a large amount of credibility to their share share register. I'd like to think I bring that, but uh, <laughs> I think Ivanhoe has a little bit more credibility than me. And um, in fact, this morning, South Africa Central Energy Fund has invested 1 billion rand to gain 10% of Tetra 4, which is the key subsidiary in underneath Renogen that holds uh, the, the Virginia gas project, so, which, by the way, implies that the remaining 90% is worth 9 billion and Renogen's market cap is only 5 billion. So still extremely comfortable with Renogen and Northern as stocks that will be volatile. They are, are commodity based, but uh, the tailwinds are very certainly behind both of them. Uh, Bitcorp less so. This is a world where growth is slowing down. The Fed is hacking into it. Inflationary pressure, pressures are rising. Very, very real risk of stagflation. So Bitcorp, I'd much rather substitute in for, and I like David's uh, suggestion of Omnia. I'm going to bring a different flavor there. I'm going to suggest Santova. And Santova is a non-asset-based supply chain manager, the really global logistics company. They earn most of their money outside of South Africa. They gain from the half rate traits, they gain from uh, uh, the winning market share, and as the clients trade more, they will gain from volumes as well and the rec recovery in that. Perhaps more subtly, despite the tragedy or because of the tragedy in Russia and Ukraine, alternative trade routes are being sought and there are far more demand. These are Santova's trade routes. They don't trade in Russia, they don't trade in Ukraine. Um, they have strong trading routes from, uh, from UK down into Africa. And, and Europe uh, and uh, across into, into Asia Pacific and, and the like. All of this sitting on an eight times multiple, uh, they're in closed period and management, uh, management was actually a big buyer of the share right up until closed period started. I'm anticipating a very, very strong trading update from them maybe in the next two or three weeks. Um, but uh, that's, that's, that's my, my overview, Val, back to you. Thanks, Keith. Very interesting and uh, and uh, pretty diverse mix. So the nice, the beauty of the SA stock picks uh, uh, chats that we've been having is it really showcased the diversity. So you had all the way from one of our larger miners in SA to uh, Renogen, which is a small cap with a decent return uh, that's played out here. Uh, and Centova, another interesting pick, one we will definitely watch. Uh, it's really great that we can feature some of the small and mid caps. And like I keep saying, that the South African market and the stocks listed on the JC have such diversity. And and as uh, you know, we always say markets are so connected, they cyclical, and and these changes and these reviews really bring that to the fore in terms of how things can change in even such short periods of time. Uh, you think of the Warren Buffett, met, met, uh, um, you know, investment thesis, which is generally decade long investment thesis, whereas uh, on our six months that we're showing here, we're showing pretty uh, different and in some cases resilient returns in certain stocks. So well done, Keith. Uh, I, I know it's been tough markets with the bit, bit corp, but uh, but resilient in some of the others. So uh, we'll watch the cent over uh, over the couple of months to come. And thank you for highlighting that. Great. Um, thank you for that. Next up, we have Patrice. Thank you very much, Aldine. Um, and hello to all the. Um, I think in terms of my picks, quite satisfied with the overall performance on an equally weighted basis over that period. The three uh, delivered a return of about 32%. The 
Porsche over that period did about eight. So um, overall, nice outperformance. Um, if you recall, two of my picks have been two steady eddy dividend com compounders, first rand and cash build, and one which I would put in the box of a value play, Sassel. And, and I'll discuss a little bit more about um, its prospects um, um, later on. So to start with, in terms of first rain, quite happy with the performance and the investment case that I put forward. It's up 33% since it, it was um, introduced. Um, really the premier retail bank in South Africa. Um, earnings at last reported for the six months of December was up 42% and dividends up 43%. So it's a nice dividend play. You get the dividend yield of five and a half percent. Very solid capital position, one of the highest in the industry. Um, if you compare to to the peers, um, it's CT one ratio of thirteen point six percent. What I want to stress, and I spoke about this at the previous show, is the strength of the retail franchise in F and B, where returns on assets are just about under four percent. If you compare that to Absa or NetBank, where return on assets are are, are, are around one percent. And very good cost control, cost to income ratio of 52.4%, really uh, well below the other years, uh, which are which are above 55%. So very efficient operation, uh, very strong thrush in, in terms of the digital platform, returns on equity, which I think is a big driver of the rating of the bank at 20.1%. I think sustainably, we think it can go all the way back to 25%. So. On a forward P of 11 times, price to 2.5 times, still quite happy with the stock, um, despite the fact that it's performed so well. We still see some upside. It's part of the top 10 in the Ashburton Equity Fund. So one which I would keep out in and which I think can still perform quite strongly going forward. So that's that was a, the first one. The, the other pick, which didn't perform on paper as well, cash build, which looks like on a price return basis down 3%. I, I want to spend a bit more time um, explaining again the investment case. That's the largest retailer of building materials in Southern Africa, if not the whole of Africa. Um, it had a very strong 2020 where at, um, into 2020-21, whereby there was a bit of catch up uh, from the lockdown. So if you look at year on year numbers, um, they look that the numbers are, are, are down substantially, but I don't think that you can use the the previous year as the right base simply because there was so much catch, uh, pent up demand and catch up in, in sales um, in the previous period. And also bear in mind that they had 36 stores in KZN impacted by the riots and, and looting that's on a base of 317 stores. So that makes looking at a sustainable basis of earnings for the company quite tricky, which they do disclose in their latest results, which is the, the half year to December. So if you look at this, um, excluding the stores which were looted, the earnings were around 12 Rand 50, comparing to 13 Rand 40 the previous period. That's down about 7%, which is not as bad as the headline number. Um, if I annualize that, I think, uh, the company can deliver for the full year to June about 23 rand of earnings on a share price of 267 rand. That's a year of 11.5%. But I think what this chart, which shows the performance misses, is the fact that um, the show that we initially had was in, in August. Um, there was a very high second half dividend paid in, in, on the 21st of September. That was 22 rands of dividend. And the company um, declared now um, five rand eighty sevens of dividends, which will be paid on the twenty second of March. So, if you had followed the pick, you would have collected close to twenty eight rands of dividends. Um, you know, second half of last year and first half of this year. This would have given you already a dividend yield of about ten percent. I know there was uh, a very high dividend in the base, but I still think. On the current base of earnings, which is delivered 256 million rand of earnings uh, for the first half, you have to go back to the first half of 2017 to get a higher um, earnings level. So basically, the company has been doing extremely well, better than the pre-COVID performance of 2019 or 2018. Um, strong dividend play. I still think 
um, earning a five and a half percent dividend yield on a stock like this is very attractive and it will continue to do well going forward. And then to, to, to move on to the last pick, which obviously um, you speak about the war and it's not, it wasn't in, in my base case. I, I, I was looking at the valuation of Cecil based on much lower rand oil price. The rand oil price obviously uh, in large part due to, to the, the turmoil uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine went up close to 40%. But um, nonetheless, if you look at the current investment case, we think that Sasol, which is also in the top 10 of the Ashburton Equity Fund, can deliver uh, around about 60 rand of earnings. Of course, they're gonna, uh, they're gonna incur some hedging losses maybe around 14 rand. We still think that you can look at a sustainable base of earnings of 46 rand per share on a share price of 360 odd. Um, that makes it very attractive on a PE of seven and a half to eight. Um, and if the, the oil price holds, they could deliver the year after into 2023, 90 to 100 rand of, of, of earnings. And then one of the most important drivers of the of value unlock, which concerned us at the beginning, but now we're more comfortable with, is the high debt levels. The debt to EBITDA with a strong performance of the business should drop to below one, which means that they should uh, consider removing the hedges, you know, and they'll be able to benefit from the high oil price, high chemical prices, reinstate the dividend going forward. And there might even be further value unlocked. There's, there's um, all sorts of speculations about um, um, spinning off the, the offshore assets um, and, and look for a way to, to, to reducing the valuation discount. So one which uh, we're very still happy holding, which we still feel in an environment like today where you've been discussing, Valdin, talking about the war, I think this is one stock which Unfortunately, uh, uh, it's not that we we want uh, this situation to continue, but it, if if it's a protracted situation where oil price remains elevated, it's likely to benefit going forward. Thanks, Patricia. It's definitely a difficult one because uh, uh, you have the uh, sad situation, a human situation that is happening and unfolding in the region, but then a, a proper manifestation of it positively or negative in different sectors across the world. Keith touched on it briefly, but uh, you know, inflation around the world is a massive focus area for us now on the back of, of, uh, of the uh, uh, potential war or uh, whatever phases of the war is going on. And, and that will all affect, uh, I think, even you know, different people in different ways, whether it's stocks or whether it's the man on the street in terms of, of his lifestyle, it, it really becomes real. Uh, it's quite interesting to see the moves in Cecil, uh, Patrice. If you go back to, I think, March or just after March 2020, it was a tenth of where it's at now uh, and uh, and has really come through. And I think of all our, our stocks, um, I'm sure many of the people on the line will know the likes of the U.S. Uh, uh, trading companies such as Robin Hood, etc. And I think Cecil was even one that made it on the radar of Robin Hood in terms of trading because of uh, uh, how much it had got discounted in um, in the March uh, to June period last year, uh, 2020. Uh, so yeah, some uh, some uh, decent uh, pullback or comeback in that stock. So you're not swapping out any of yours, Patrice? Not swapping um, any of the stocks, still happy that uh, they will continue to deliver over the longer term, as I mentioned, two dividend compounders and still see yeah. upside all the way to 500 rand for Cecil. Excellent. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Carmen, nice to have you back on. Thank you. I know you had a slightly shorter window of assessment. I don't know if that's good or bad in these markets, to be honest. Uh, some of these stocks can be one day games and some are, are, are proving a lot better over a longer period. But let's walk through some of your stock picks and, and, and see how they've performed. Okay, thanks, Valdine. Um, I think two of the key themes that I had when I selected my top three uh, were focused on the consumer number one and a lower income consumer um, and being the target market for the first two, which is Mr. Price and Pepco, um, as well as ensuring that I, am I still there? Sorry. Yes, you are. 
Okay, thank you. Um, as well as as the economy reopening, you know, once the restrictions were lifted, seeing the uh, malls reopening and footfall increasing, etc. Um, but we've seen that for Mr. Price, that hasn't come through as much. Yes, it has pulled back post the war. Um, recovery hasn't gotten back to what it was towards the end of last year. Uh, PEPCO similarly, um, sort of languishing at the moment um, at the 22 rand level. And then my last one was related to a call on the vaccinations. And had you listened to me and uh, sold out a week later, you would have made some money. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic's won on this one yet again. And the basis of that was um, twofold. One, uh, Aspen had a transaction that was uh, pulled post um, uh, the September meeting uh, or the September session. Um, and then adding on to that, we've seen that vaccines have largely been uh, a, a sort of misnomer in South Africa. And the expectation initially was that they were going to have a, an agreement with Johnson & Johnson which they have subsequently done, but unfortunately in an environment where we've seen vaccination rates have dropped, number one, and it seems that people have gotten to the point where it's, I had my first vaccination, uh, why do I need a booster? So there's been a lot of uh, negative sentiment, I think, around it. And I think the timing was just off in terms of, in terms of Aspen and um, it yielding some benefits for that. Uh, similarly, also pulled back uh, over the war, somewhat of a recovery, but still tracking downwards for, for that stock. So I think for me, mine's going to be a twofold swap. Um, one for diversification. So I'm going to remove PEPCO out of the, 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 um, the running as well as Aspen. And I'm going to swap them out for two completely different stocks. Uh, the one is MTN. Um, I know it has had a significant run over the last two years, we could say. However, if you look at it comparatively uh, relative to itself and even relative to Vodacom as well in South Africa, still trading at a very, very cheap basis, um, trading at a four times EV EBITDA level, number one. Uh, number two, yes, Divi is quite low, the Divi yield is low um, and still quite conservative. But if it pans out that they reach their, uh, well, they turn cash flow uh, net cash positive in the next two years, um, that could be a significant tailwind for the group, but more so I think is the potential for number one, the newly uh, appointed or given uh, PSP license in Nigeria, which feeds or leads into the FinTech uh, theme, which I think is going to be very positive for them, keeping in mind that we're seeing um, about 30% growth in the Nigerian market still, and this is on the, on the data side. Um, so you'll add on to this the PSB license uh, potential. Then we also know that they've managed to uh, stabilize their balance sheet. It was a big overhang for them for a long, for the longest time, but that also is now behind them. Significantly cash generative as well. So going forward, I think that there's still a significant upside for MTN, despite how well it has performed. Um, and then my second swap is going to be Tungela. Um, so adding in some mining sector uh, side to my, my calls. I think the significant thing there is uh, a twofold play. Number one, it was listed at the perfect time as energy prices are increasing. The outlook is that energy prices and specifically coal prices will um, stay at a, a, a the high level that it is. And I think the, the key theme for the coal sector we've seen based on about how Tungela was pulled out of Anglo is that there's been this move away um, from dirty energy, uh, specifically coal. So we've seen a lot of financial institutions pulling their funding and declaring that they will no longer fund these, these institutions. But we're seeing in China and we're seeing in Europe that as much as we're trying to transition to uh, cleaner energy, um, China, I know, is starting to or ensuring that its coal uh, power stations will continue. They are looking at building new ones as well. Um, whereas on the other side, we're seeing a very low investment in uh, uh, coal specifically, um, and that feeds really well into Tungela. Um, similarly, very, on a relative basis, it remains very, very cheap despite significant run. Um, we saw the accelerated book bill that happened in last week at a 12% discount, so a, a nice way to get into the stock, I think, uh, marginally down. But I think the key thing for Tingela is going to be its cash generation number one. It is trading at a dividend yield that is very attractive, above 11%. Uh, 
Um, so I think that uh, this will be my, my last edition. I'm keeping Mr. Price in. I still remain of the opinion that um, based on a limited amount of news flow, etc., we haven't seen the full impact of a recovery for the group. Um, their balance sheet remains very, very strong. We yet to see the impact of power fashion um, into the group and the, the rollout of that. So keeping Mr. Price in, adding Tungela and adding MTN. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, we had Tungela uh, as one of our stock picks, I think, in the second session by those by that group. So that was also August. Uh, raised a lot of controversial questions, especially uh, at the time. Uh, but um, very brave, uh, Carmen, I have to say, very brave uh, given the current uh, rally and where we're at. But very interesting um, uh, discussion moves and reflection. Uh, lots of chit chat in the back, so we actually don't have any questions online, some comments, no questions. But do any of our panelists have any thoughts across all of our speakers today and your stock picks and, uh, and any, uh, any uh, discussion? David, I'm going to pick on you. I, I, I'm going for Patrice because I don't quite. The question I want to ask Patrice, and I'm not criticizing it, is Cecil at all, because uh, I think uh, the gods have favored them. You know, we thought this was a business that was going to fall into one big crate uh, some time ago. And I think, you know, everybody says, oh, we should have bought it. We could have bought it when it was down at 27. But at that time, it could have actually collapsed and come under severe pressure. I'm asking Patrice on the chemical side, you know, where does he see this developing? And, you know, do we see that side bearing up? I've I've lost kind of, um, what's the word, um, understanding of Lake Charles and how this is contributing. Because what Cecil did do is they had to sell off a lot of assets. So they had to do a lot of um, kind of, not, not manipulating, but they had to do a, like Aspen, they had to work very hard to get their balance sheet right, you know. Um, what, what I'm asking, Patrice, is outside of the oil side, how does the chemical side look? And, and uh, you know, for somebody who's quite interested in agriculture and, and uh, for fertilizer, are they exposed to this? And is there any upside on that area? Thanks, David. Patrice? Yeah, sure. So, so obviously, this is quite a multifaceted question, and, and, and David is right. So if we look back, where Sasso was when it had plummeted to 27 rand. I mean, it was a question of survival. So, um, and 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 whether it we it would be able to service its debt given uh, the very um, low to negative cash flows. Um, and that was linked, obviously. And you talk on uh, about Lake Charles. That that was linked to what was going on offshore and the debt that he had taken. So now to, to answer your question directly, chemical prices have increased and, and, and gone much higher. And, and it's really a play on the reopening trade, industrialization, and the fact that now that the, the build is behind us, it's able to deliver free cash flow. So, so that's the main driver. I wouldn't say that the fertilizer business is big enough to make a huge difference. It does. It, does operate, um, especially in South Africa, um, uh, such a business, but I think it's still quite small um, in the whole um, um, scheme of things. I think a bigger issue is whether there is unlock to be had from listing the offshore business, the US business. Um, that's one up for debate, I would say, uh, David. And, and right now, I think the business finds itself the beneficiary from um, increased operating efficiencies, um, demand being strong, chemical prices being uh, fairly strong, um, and they would be able to realize, they wouldn't be able to make back the investment they've made, uh, they've put into Lake Charles, but if, uh, the share price was discounting that whole business at zero to negative for a long period of time. So right now, I think there's a value to be had uh, for it, but we're not, we're not in favor of, of them um, splitting off the business simply because then you would be trapped in the South African assets, which might attract a bigger discount because of all the, the, the issues in terms of carbon emissions and the like. So we prefer the business to stay as, as it is as a whole, rather than to try to break up the business, which was one of the 
type of options that were being discussed to reduce the debt burden um, a year or two ago. Good, interesting. Definitely one we'll have to watch as it plays out, not just for Sassel only, but you know others in the space, in the sector, and um, and certainly how a green economy as well transitions and how people just invest or not. You know, all these businesses will have to assess along the way. Very, very interesting. Um, LD, you know, we, we, we're a very forgiving community. You know, businesses lose millions of rands. They write it off, you know, that's a famous yeah. journal entry. No, you no, just... no, David, it just becomes deep <laughs> <you> then. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. Yeah, yeah, no, we don't want to be. We, we just definitely... do a journal entry and all our problems are gone. <laughs> no, David, we definitely don't want to be reminded of the billions that we've given away or written off. Let's, let's think positively to the value creation we're going to get in the billions that are going to be made in South Africa. Uh, uh... <laughs> Guys, thank you very much for your time and uh, always very engaging and useful conversation. Thank you for the insights that you've shared with our audience. We've had a decent turnout today and get pretty good uh, views on the repeat, which we stream on Business Day TV as well in the in hopefully not too far from the stock moves uh, so that they don't get thrown out the water. But thank you for your time. Thanks, Bright, David, Keith, Patrice, Carmen, and to our guests who have joined. Always just to add the disclaimer that this does not constitute advice, but just a good discussion that we are having uh, and that the views expressed are that of our uh, guests and not that of the JSCs. But thank you very much for your time uh, and lovely to have you all. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you.